Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the sixth International Symposium on Environmental Sociology in East Asia. Today's event will commence. Let's first welcome Deputy Director of the Environmental Protection Agency, Director Debu Deputy Zhan Shengui, to the stage. Uh, Deputy Principal Zhang, Dr. Shu, Dr. Zhou, distinguished guests, and ladies and gentlemen, good morning. First of all, it's my pleasure to enjoy the success international symposiums on environmental sociology in East Asia. <coughs> we are facing various risks from climate change food security and tra tradi traditional to uh, new environmental pollutants. Therefore, how to ensure social security and sustainable development becomes to ensure uh, becomes an important issue. I am very I'm also very grateful to welcome our international scholars and exp experts getting to discussing about how to respond to various environmental issues and to stress sustainable grown region policy in East Asia for today's event. <coughs> there is high correlation between human activities and environmental impacts. There is excessive greenhouse gas emitted by human act active will all alter life of stem lines system and other measurements of mother nature. And their changes will then react on us, namely altering our health. Global warming raises on addresses the probability and name of deaths of heat waves, air pollution and, and other negative consequences caused by extremely weather events or 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 Elective realities, testers are all becoming <coughs> precious matters as they will directly or indirectly pose threats to humans and the existence of other creatures. <coughs> as climate change issues are highly expressed, uh, specialized, and complicated issues. The important and value of this firm to implement environmental just through <coughs> through scaling the capabilities of people of different pro professional backgrounds. <coughs> Finally, I wish of I wish all of you good health and a most successful form. Thank you, you very much. And sorry, I, I have, I, I must uh, uh, leave in. I have, uh, and my next schedule is book on 9.30. Oh, thank you, and sorry. Thank you, Director Jen, for your warm remarks. We'll now invite Vice President of National Taiwan University, Professor Zhang Qingrei, to say some remarks. Uh, Ding Su, Professor Zhou, and all the distinguished guests, 
it's my great honor to represent the National Taiwan University to welcome all of you to come to our campus for this very important, you know, conference. Nowadays, actually, the society, I recently learned from my colleague, they told me the new society is a VUCA society. V as a vitality, U as a uncertainty, C as a complexity, A as a ambiguity. And uh, I translate in Mandarin, say, Hu Gao Zi Dai. And uh, because the uh, society becomes so ambiguity and uh, uncertainty, so the environmental sociology become much critical than before. We have, you know, the existing problem, in particular in Taiwan. We have a lot of natural disaster, typhoon, earthquake, landsliding, anything you can name it, just like Japan, but not in Korea, because you don't have much earthquake as Taipei, Taiwan and Japan. And also, the new thing also coming. We feel very uncertainty because the new technology is coming. What artificial can bring the human society? Nobody know. It, they all mention about the the first industrial revolution replaced the human labor, and the latest new wave may replace the human brain. If that is the truth, then what we should do? So environment social sociology need to find a new way for the human being, for this century, is very critical. critical. And uh, Professor Zhou spent a lot of effort actually on the thing related to this. And our College of Social Science also pay a lot of attention on this. And I definitely believe this workshop, all the experts participate in this inter conference, will study hard and uh, learn, exchange knowledge to each other. and. Uh, I hope also can, you know, pass a lot of good know-how to all scientists in Taiwan, and I definitely believe this conference will be a very successful one. Thank you for participating. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Zhang Qingrei. Please welcome the chair of ISESEA6 committee and the president of this conference, Professor Zhou Guitian. of the ISESEA 6 biannual conference. And uh, on behalf of Risk Society and the Policy Research Center, National Taiwan University, I would like to welcome all of our distinguished uh, far from different countries. And uh, also, I thank every uh, participant uh, uh, coming to Taipei to National Taiwan University for taking the research exchange, for taking the practical experience exchange, and uh, uh, for engaging in more cooperative uh, framework. So uh, I would like to also raise the issues uh, of the, what is our goal of the, this conference. So let me show some pictures. So first of all, we can see that actually, yeah, gradually we confront the increased uh, radical climate change over the world. And uh, this picture shows that uh, the Katrina hurricanes uh, that actually impact uh, New Orleans in 2005, very seriously. And uh, this picture shows that uh, in 2010, in Pakistan, actually, actually uh, the very serious flooding uh, result in so many people uh, lost their house. And uh, also in North Australia, uh, 
in 2011, also very serious flooding. And uh, in 2012, the one third the Thailand yeah, land actually under the water. I think this uh, is a very important this phenomenon. And uh, this picture shows that uh, the bushfire occurred yeah, in uh, California in 2015. And I would like to show this picture. This is like uh, this is actually the pictures I described that, that this is a disaster aesthetic. It's uh, like the picture of the, the, the ruin and uh, the Lord of the Ruin. It's the very actually very tragic uh, aesthetic. And uh, this picture shows that actually the, in the end of the uh, 2015. The, that uh, uh, in American, in middle American, people actually suffer under the flooding. But in Washington DC, at the same time, at the end of the, uh, December, the HIV people uh, swore the uh, t-shirt and joked yeah, by very exchange, uh, very, yeah, exchange, uh, yeah, exchange, yeah, yeah, climate weather. And uh, this picture show the flooding also at the same time occurred in UK, which also brought their hundred yeah, uh, raining record, and we can see surely. And uh, this picture shows the forest fire. Maybe everyone forgot it. Actually, it uh, occurred it just in June, yeah, this year. And there's also so many people's life uh, was lost. Uh, so I would like to show this. Is, uh, this picture is uh, made by uh, Abit Min Munch in 18. Uh, 93. Uh, I would like to show this is actually the picture of the risk civilization we met. We actually follow the Western society and uh, go into a very tragic uh, yeah, world by the industrial capitalism. But I think this is the philosophy and the reflection. But on Asian side, actually we confront the Fukushima accident in 2011. And uh, this extent, uh, we can show this picture shows so many radical, uh, yeah, yeah, radioactive contaminant the water, yeah, yeah, actually flew yeah over the Pacific uh, rain, and uh, also this accident uh, result in the health risk, and uh, result in the very serious impact on the tourist industry in Japan, and then also result in the yeah, yeah, food risk. Okay, and uh, this picture showed so many radioactive uh, spread over the world, particularly in Asia. Yeah, in just in uh, 2011, this picture shows the actually the soya fairy, yeah, tragedy or accident occurred in 2015 in Seoul, uh, in in South Korea, and this is a, a rescue yeah picture, and uh, actually in Seoul. Also in 2011, the flooding occurred and the result in very serious problems. This picture also sh sh shows this picture. And uh, just uh, not too far, the, this picture shows the flooding occurred in the, in the September in 2015 in Japan, in very famous tourist yeah, place, Guenu Chuan. Okay, I think our yeah, Japanese colleague can read it, the, the character. And uh, also this picture is actually in uh, 2009 uh, in Taiwan, actually we actually come from the very tragic, yeah, main, uh, 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 then slide, yeah, smart slide, actually uh, by the smart slide, so over uh, 300 people actually buried, yeah, actually suddenly lost their life. And uh, people think what is the next step of us after the at, at disaster, we call it the Morocco Typhoon disaster, is a at at uh, disaster. So and the, I would like to show this picture. This picture is made by the founder of the Taiwanese very, very famous uh, dancing group uh, called uh, Cloud Get. Yeah, I think uh, the founder Lin Huai Min actually he re he reflect that every people, everyone face very tragedy, very disaster world we yeah uh, faced. So he's cited the term the Weichen from the Buddhism uh, text called everyone, every human being is small particle. By, the, by this, the terms we can see everyone is not only a small particle, we also cry, claim, request a more 
yeah, better future, yeah, in order to avoid the tragic world, yeah, occur again and again. So many people look for their new paths, yeah, yeah, in many countries. I think just uh, show the pictures, yeah. They want to more, yeah, fresh air, want to more safety world, want to more clean energy. So, so when we actually confront uh, the very anthropological shock, and we suffer under the risk civilization. I think that, uh, I just think, what is our next step as scholar in our region, in our world? What is our cosmopolitan reflection, strategy, and uh, action? So we need more to engage so social science embedding in our region for changing the radical uh, transformative world. So I think this is the goal, what I yeah, support that, yeah, uh, of this conference, we might uh, construct more action-oriented knowledge for making discourse, making identity, making institution, making representation in terms of uh, promoting the better future by confronting the very radical transformative world. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Zhou, for your kind remarks. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's indeed my great, greatest, great pleasure and honor uh, to be the moderator for this uh, keynote speech session. And because the speaker is actually is very relevant to the environmental sociology, not just in the United States, not just in uh, to Taiwan, but in the world. Uh, Professor Riley Dunlap is the founding father I don't know how to say a better word, or pioneering, pioneer, but founding father, it has a relevance because it is really established the discipline called environmental sociology. And the last night, we had a chance to chat, even though this was my first time to see him in person, but I have been familiar with his work since the mid and late 1970s when I began to explore the possibility to establish the environmental sociology teaching and research in Taiwan. So his early work on environmental sociology has been a very great inspiring for me to, to learn how can we convince the people, the, the, the students, the academic community to be convinced that we do need social scientists in general and sociologists in particular to get into the field to deal with the environmental issue to tackle the environmental problems and provide some insight so that we can recover can be re save uh, the environment ecology of Taiwan so professor Riley Dunlap in his early work with his colleague, William Canton, and a little bit junior one, Frederick Patel, uh, work a series of writing how to collectively to institutionalize the subfield called environmental sociology. And one important message, I think it's very still, I still lingering in my mind, is that our founding fathers of sociology had thrown away the environmental fact in order to establish the discipline, the social fact-based sociology. Now it's a time in, in 20th century, the first of night, it was at uh, uh, 1970s and 80. So in the 20th century, we have to bring back the environmental fact into the social world. So, and that is the very nature, and that is the very, very fact, very important that, that we need environmental sociology. It means, put it shortly, to bring back environment into our sociological endeavor. And that is the foundation. That is the very intellectual foundation of environmental sociology. And, um, and then later, he keep writing with caring capacity, the concept in how to use the ecological 
concept to bring into and give a sociological life, sociological significance. And that inspired me and I certainly inspired my students and who are now environmental sociologists here uh, play a very important role in Taiwan. So, so relevance is very through intellectual in communication, through the, the, the academics change, and we are very honored to have him in person uh, to Taiwan. Uh, that's, uh, that is uh, Professor Riley Dunlap. And then now, this is uh, the intellectual background. The, the, and then I have to do the for, formal title. And the formal title prepared by the organizer is very simple. Let me read it. Distinguished research, I uh, know that's me. Uh, professor uh, uh, Riley Dunlap is a region professor of sociology and Lawrence L. and uh, Georgia Ina Desert Professor, Department of Sociology, Oklahoma State University. And I remember uh, formerly he has a long, he has a long year teaching in uh, Washington State University. And in between, I don't know, no, no move uh, somewhere and, and then come and back. And he, I think he has been in Oklahoma State University for some time, and he's a very lawyer, apparently just like myself. In, in my 37 years, uh, teach research uh, all in Academic Seneca, and the other teaching institution is here, National Taiwan University, and other is nominal uh, to give a lectures. And this. So without further ado, please join me to welcome our keynote speech speaker, Professor Riley Dunlap. And, and then, yeah. and then he, uh, the title of his talk is very challenging. And again, I, I assure you, very inspiring. Is this, how the U.S. Become, became an impediment to international climate, change, climate governance examining the climate change denial movement. And last night we chat about it, we said this is a counter movement. And we sociologists not only study the, the pro, proactive environment, we have to do the negative environment. Please, uh, Professor Dunlap, it's all yours. Thank you very much. It's uh, for the warm introduction, if I may say, Michael. Yes. And uh, it's a real pleasure and an honor to be here. I want to thank, oh, is this on? It's okay. Oh, oh goodness. Okay. I think this is so heavy, I'll be tired. <laughs> okay. Anyway, it's a real pleasure and an honor to be here to see many old friends, and I hope to make many new ones. And uh, I always like to start by saying, <clears throat> second, did I need a glass of water? How fortunate I feel to come to a quote international conference and be able to speak English. And um, I understand, I like to say the US, England, we sort of won the intellectual lottery, but thank you very much for your efforts to learn English because uh, I know how difficult it can be. Well, some of you may have noticed the U.S. has been a little strange lately, uh, beyond a little strange, right? And I'm going to give you some insights into, in particular, why we have become uh, so, I would call it such an outlier in terms of climate change in particular. So here we go. Uh, you may have noticed that President Trump, I still, this is the first time I think I've put those two words together. I don't like to, I just call him Trump. Um, anyway, we withdrew, he withdrew the United States from the Paris Accord. It's one of many things. Some of you may remember that a long, long time ago, the U.S. was a real leader in environmental protection, setting up the world's first environmental protection agency, I believe, passing major legislation. We've come a long way, and it's not been good in general. So the th key theme of my talk, and let me take my watch off and start my timer. We've start, they've told me to talk for quite a while, but we've 
we've started late, so. Um, anyway, my theme is to try to explain how this happened. So I'm going to talk about literally a climate change denial movement, or we could call it the counter movement. If we think of climate scientists, climate climate policy makers, climate groups as the climate change movement, Al Gore and so forth. This is the counter movement. Now, I would argue, and any rational person I think would, that the Paris Accord represents the peak of success of this organized movement. In fact, they've celebrated widely when this happened. This denial movement has been in existence, however, since the late 1980s, shortly after James Hansen gave famous testimony in the Senate saying the global warming has already begun. This movement took off. And it's just grown over time. It's become a major factor. Here I just went ahead and I didn't want to put it in the title, but I said making the U.S. truly a villain rather than a leader in climate change governance. So again, my goal is to help you understand this. Now, if you were in the U.S., but maybe even over here, you hear when people think of climate change denial in America especially, they immediately think of ExxonMobil, the world's richest corporation, I believe, but it's really led the way in climate change denial, very famous, especially decades ago. However, these fossil fuel companies, and Exxon's not alone, they've been leaders, uh, they've uh, what I call central players, but over the years, this a complex climate change denial movement with multiple components, all opposing efforts to deal with climate change has evolved. A uh, well-known science journalist back in 2007 wrote an article on, uh, for Newsweek, and she used the term denial machine. And here it was, a famous article. Uh, well, this was a famous issue, and I'm going to make right down here. And she took a lot of flack. People were very critical of her. Oh, there's no such thing as this. They had been in existence since 1989, but they were sort of operating behind the curtain. And in fact, I like to describe this work I've been doing, started this in the mid-90s already, is pulling back the curtain on the denial machine. How many of you have seen the movie The Wizard of Oz? Anyone? And you know they ex pull the curtain back, and he's back there, and don't look at the, ignore the man behind the curtain. Well, this denial machine literally operated behind a curtain for a long, long time. But now it's getting more and more attention. And that's kind of my life's work now, is to help contribute to this. OK, here's a simple, but obviously sort of complex model of the key components it's hard to represent anything in, in a diagram. But up here at the very top, we do have the fossil fuel industries, not only ExxonMobil, but coal companies. Oh, the American Petroleum Institute, which is the trade group, really uh, hugely influential. Then we have much of corporate America. A, the US Chamber of Commerce is a major leader in climate change denial, the National Association of Manufacturers. Some of these change over time. A number of groups, Nike, Google, have withdrawn from the US Chamber of Commerce because their uh, efforts to deny climate change just have become so outrageous. But here we have something, and things were, in some of your countries, most perhaps, you just don't have as anything like America. But these conservative foundations, so rich people give money to avoid taxes to set up their own foundations. In the old days, we had the Rockefeller Foundation, the Ford Foundation. But increasingly, it's very conservative billionaires. How many of you have heard of the Koch brothers, K-O-C-H? In America, finally, they've been exposed. They are uh, worth $88 billion, and they have funded right-wing efforts all over America for two decades. And they've literally become infamous now. 
Then you have something that I'm going to focus a lot on, conservative think tanks. Again, something unique in America, and I'll talk about these. But you may have heard of groups such as the American Enterprise Institute, Cato Institute, uh, this one, Competitive Enterprise Institute, Heritage Foundation, and I'll explain how these groups were formed and why shortly. Then you have what we call front groups the Global Climate Coalition. So these people, especially corporations, they're concerned about their public image, public relations. So they don't like to be viewed at, as uh, you know, denying climate change. So they not only join the Chamber of Commerce, but they join a group like the Global Climate Coalition, which existed from the late uh, early 90s throughout the early 2000s, and all the big corporations joined this, and then they let the Global Climate Coalition fund denial campaigns while they stayed in the background. Then you have something I'll focus a lot of attention on, what I call contrarian scientists. They don't like to be called deniers, but they are. This is a small number of scientists, most without very good credentials, who gladly deny climate change and other environmental problems, especially if they can make money doing so. But it's not just for money, it's for uh, prestige, uh, people pay attention. Then we have something again that, I don't know compared to your countries, but in America we have something called the conservative echo chamber. And one of the most, to under, you. America would not be in the shape it's in right now without Rupert Murdoch and Fox News. We let someone from Australia come in, and Fox News has had a profound, and in my view, highly negative impact on America. But also there's uh, conservative radio, talk radio shows. There's uh, just uh, the Wall Street Journal's editorial page, now that Rupert Murdoch bought the Wall Street Journal. It's a forum for denial material. Then, of course, you have, starting in about 2007, the rise of all these denial blogs. And there are many, many blogs where these people write, post things. They take their work. They popularize it. Then you have the po conservative politicians. And as you'll see in this talk, the Republican Party, also known as the GOP, for it was once the grand old party, but the Republican Party has literally become a key agent of denial. And last, down here you have AstroTurf organizations. So as sociologists, we, we all know about, I keep wanting to speak to this thing, and it's not even relevant. So. Um, you, grassroots movements, you know, the bottom up, like so much I know in your countries you have these. Well, AstroTurf are pretend grassroots. This is when a company pays its workers to do something. And so after Obama was elected and the Democrats controlled the Senate and the House, it looked like legislation to control carbon emissions might actually pass in 2009, 10. Many corporations, the Americans for, well, and the, these other groups, Americans for Prosperity, run by the Koch brothers, sponsored regulation reality tours. Freedom Works also got money from the Koch brothers, had hot air rallies. And companies would let their workers off, and they would bus them to places and have a big rally saying, oh, if we try to put a price on carbon, it will destroy America, or destroy our economy, so forth. So this is what we're up against. Uh, this is very, co this complex machine. And the different groups change over time, okay? Some, some of these are no longer existing, but new ones come along. All right, so I've talked about many conservative actors. And I want to focus on the conservative movement. The role of the conservative movement, especially its think tanks in leading denial campaigns. I'm gonna give you a quick overview of the growth of anti-environmentalism in general within the conservative movement, and then talk about how it transitioned from anti-environmental to climate change denial. And I'm going to examine the key role of these think tanks 
I'm going to highlight the strategies they employ, especially something I call manufacturing uncertainty and manufacturing controversy, related but distinguishable. And I'm going to conclude, as I already have once, <laughs> the denial machine has succeeded in making climate change controversial in the US and other parts of the world, and thereby undermining efforts to reduce carbon emissions. They've blocked policy making. So here's a bit of historical background. Some of you, and it's hard when I'm speaking to a non-American audience, but you've heard of the 1960s, you know, the hippies and anti-war, anti-Vietnam, drugs, sex, rock and roll, supposedly, and all. The, well, anyway, that really scared a lot of conservative Americans, especially rich Americans. Oh my God, our country is going crazy. We've got to protect the real America. So they responded by setting up, they, they got together, and we got to fight this, that they set up their foundations and think tanks. Joseph Coors so, was a key founder in the Herod, of the Heritage Foundation, which played a major role in the Reagan administration. And at least when I'm around, my graduate students never drink Coors beer. That's right. And you should never drink Coors beer either. He's a very bad well, he's dead now, but the family still funds his stuff. But what they did, they looked at this and they said, we have all these movements, the civil rights movement, the anti-war movement, we had the women's movement, that really scared these old men. Uh, and that was bad, but we also had federal government, John Kennedy, Lyndon Johnson, you had things called the Great Society, trying to create kind of a welfare state. And these people said, my God, they're trying to make us communists like Sweden. Well, they don't really know the difference between communists and slight socialists. So these, now notice this, I'm shifting from conservative think tanks to CTTs from here on to save space. So don't forget, conservative, Heritage, Cato, these, they became key components of the social, uh, the conservative movement. So we know that social movements need social movement organizations, right? So you can think of conservative think tanks as sort of the key social movement organizations for the conservative movement. Now, these, move, these think tanks have done incredibly negative things to America. They are responsible for getting America slightly liberal in the 60s and 70s to where we are today, more and more to the right. But here's some of the things they've done. They pr in the early days, the Brookings Institute, you may have heard of that. Some, these were set up to do research. Think tanks were viewed as legitimate uh, producers of knowledge, but the conservatives never saw it that way. These think tanks were set up to promote conservative ideas and ideologies. They were activists, not pursuers of truth. They provide resources and networking opportunities. So you get these people, and I kind of joke, it's the word conservative intellectual is kind of an oxymoron these days. It's really hard to find one, because they're kind of just guns for hire. Uh, we used to have a lot of serious conservative intellectuals. Uh, but these people, they start out in college nowadays. The Koch brothers fund different, group, uh, different educational programs for these. They go on, they join one of these groups, they move up, they move to Washington, D.C., get a more important position and so forth. So it gives them something to do. And then they complain that academia won't hire them. Well, they don't do res real research, you know, they don't publish scholarly journals and so forth. But these think tanks also, they're constantly publishing and diffusing information. They put out, as we'll see, books. They write editorials for newspapers. They put out policy reports. They give it to members of Congress, the media. They enable the circulation of elites across administrations. So under Clinton-Gore, a lot of these people were off at think tanks. When the second Bush comes in, they move from the think tank into the Bush administration. Then Obama gets elected, they move out, and they only have to go a few blocks down Washington, D.C.'s K Street or something, 
And now under Trump, this, he didn't have connections. He didn't know all these people. And the think tanks have given Trump the people he's appointing, especially in the area of environment and climate change. They're all uh, provided by these. What is really sad and hard for you to imagine, they've sort of come, these think tanks and their personnel, to be seen as an alternate academia. They're viewed, despite their activism, as real scholars, as pursuers of knowledge. And it's so common in America to see a TV show or a radio, hear a radio program, and today we're gonna to talk about climate change. And over here we have Dr. So-and-so from Stanford, who has published 150 articles, highly cited, and is a member of the National Academy of Sciences. And over here we have Dr. So-and-so, a distinguished scholar at the Heritage Foundation, who just wrote an interesting editorial for the Wall Street Journal and they're going to debate. It's, they're treated with respect as if they're experts when they're not experts at all, they're ideologues. But boy, have they had incredible influence. Uh, the whole idea of trickle-down economics, if we cut taxes for the rich, it will benefit the whole economy and workers. Reagan started this, and I like to say, the rich have been trickling down on the rest of us uh, for decades now, and the rest of the country is just poor. There are so many books written about this, but here's a good one, and you could, it's fairly old, but all you need is the title to find it on Amazon. Now, we, so we have this big conservative movement that really takes off in the 1970s. Why the interest in environmentalism? Well, in the 80s, they weren't all that interested. They didn't pay too much attention. They paid some. But an interesting thing happened. Historically, conservatives in America had one leading goal, and that was to defeat communism. Oh, my God, the danger of communism. They're going to you know, fall like dominoes. You know, That's how we got Vietnam, and next it will be... Japan and so, all this crazy stuff. Well, anyway, we had two things happen in the early 90s. We had the Rio Earth Summit, which I had the great privilege of going to, and it really brought environment into the top of the public agenda and as an international issue, and you had the fall of the Soviet Union. So the conservative, uh, the communist threat goes away, but now you get this green threat. So we like to say that the conservatives, especially when Clinton Gore came in, because Gore was viewed as very pro-environmental, they basically substituted a green scare. The red scare was going away, but conservatives like to have enemies, nowadays immigrants. You know? And so this was a new one. And so this is kind of a common theme, environmentalism. They're like watermelons. They have, they're green on the outside, but if you cut them open, and God knows a lot of those conservatives would like to, um, this is what you're really gonna get. Okay, hurry, oh, gotta got take your pictures fast. Okay, ready? Okay, one, two, three. Okay, I gotta go. Now, so why did they launch, though, the, in more technical terms, this counter movement. There's a classic article on counter movements here. We argue that three conditions promote the rise of counter movements. Maybe the movement shows signs of success. The 1990 Earth Day, which was the 20th anniversary, was a gigantic celebration in America. It was really big. Public opinion soared to its highest levels before, ever before or ever since, but also we saw this idea of it be becoming international. Second, the interest of some public, uh, so environmentalism was showing signs of success, the interest of some population are threatened. Industry, conservatives, people with money, people who don't like regulations. And third, political allies are available to help. Now let's look at this. 
in the 90s. So here we go. I've basically said this. Second, this is a time where the Reagan types, the Thatcher types, all of this neoliberal anti-regulation, mm -hmm. they thought, ah, we're changing the world. We're going to get rid of common property resources. We're going to let India you know, make their pro property private so uh, corporations come in, in and use it and so forth. And um, we're going to have free trade so American and other corporations could have unlimited access to resources around the world. They didn't like that. They saw that as threatened. And then what happened in 1994's election, Clinton and Gore are elected in 92. 94, just like happened later with Obama, there was a huge Republican victory, and they took over Con uh, the House of Representatives for the first time in decades. And a terrible man named Newt Gingrich, and I find to have that on film, uh, he really introduced the partisanship that was going on. So this was, we had to aid now. We want to have a counter movement, and now we've got Republicans in Congress who will help us, and they really did. So the conservative movement mounted this major counter movement designed to undermine environmentalism that they saw as a threat to their political economic agenda, all these things, free market, privatization, free trade, not just in the US, but internationally. And again, it was funded, remember, the foundations and so forth up there. Now, here's what happened, though. I have to skip some things. When Ronald Reagan came in in the 80s, right after Jimmy Carter had talked about, we've got to learn to live with less, energy is a real problem, et cetera, and Reagan came in with the old cowboy riding his horse, he's sort of like, I'm going to make America. Oh my god, we can't, that phrase. But basically, that same theme, there's no limits. All we have to do is invoke the American spirit, be optimistic. Well, Reagan actually was very anti-environmental. And uh, he also put some bad people in charge of the Environmental Protection Agency and so forth. But the American public at that time was smart enough, and they were concerned about environment, and there was actually a backlash. Reagan had to get rid of his director of environmental quality, Anne Gorsuch, the mother of our new right-wing Supreme Court nominee, our member now. Um, the Secretary of Interior had to resign. And so they realized we can't be overtly, openly anti-environmental. Americans do care about clean air and water. Now, they still, Reagan was never pro-environmental, and despite this backlash, he did unfortunately get reelected. But it wasn't quite as disastrous. But here's what they did then. They said, going back to the 90s, they looked at Reagan and they said, if we openly attack environmental regulations, that might produce a backlash. So what we're going to do is this. When people say we need new regulations, they have some kind of evidence. You know, sometimes environmentalists exaggerate and they take scientific evidence and it's not always good uh, usage. But in general, most regulations, whether it be on radiation or chemicals, there's some evidence that asbestos, lead, mercury, these are harmful. So what these people said, since they employ scientific evidence, to uh, support regulations, we're going to challenge the evidence. And they started doing something that we call promoting environmental skepticism. So in an article that I'll talk about shortly, the fundamental, uh, we argued the fundamental characteristic of environmental skepticism, it challenges the authenticity, the reality, legitimacy of environmental problems and thus the necessity of protection policies. If the problems aren't real, they're exaggerated, why do we have to have these regulations? And they manufacture uncertainty. Corporations had long defended their products like DDT, all kinds of other chemicals. 
and especially tobacco, cigarette smoking, by saying, oh, they tell you this is harmful, but, you know, smoking really won't hurt you. And when the evidence got stronger, they would pay people, some contrarians, to come up with evidence, say, but, you know, it could just be because men smoke more and men, because they have to work harder, they're under stress, they have more heart attacks and all that. They're, they're so vulnerable and weak compared to women. Then women started to smoke a lot, and sure enough, they got cancer, et cetera. But these people were very successful. So manufacturing uncertainty is a time-tested battle against uh, a time-tested method. So they used it in the battle against environmental regulation. Here's a really good book on this uh, that goes through. But keep in mind, we're talking about industry manufacturing uncertainty on specific products. They want to say, my product is safe, all the way up to cigarettes. Now, to shed some light on that, several years ago, some colleagues and I did a study published in Environmental Politics of, we're looking at, uh, we want to look at books. There are a lot of books saying environmental problems are exaggerated. Don't believe that stuff. And we wanted to look at the link between conservative think tanks and these books. So what we did at the time, we found 141, and unfortunately had to limit ourselves to English-only books for many reasons. Even if we could find translators, it would be hard to find books in other countries. We found 141. We missed only three or so. Now, this study is getting old. We stopped way back in 2005. What we looked at is this. We wanted to find out if they were linked to a think tank. And either the author, sometimes editor, had to have a formal affiliation with the think tank, or the book was published by a think tank press. And these big think tanks have their own presses. They publish many books themselves. We had to find concrete evidence on websites or on the books of this. We found that of the 141 books, uh, 130 or 90%, 92% could be linked to a conservative think tank. And what was funny, these books, the authors would say, Oh, I'm just a lone little voice in the wilderness, and I'm trying to fight this big, terrible machine of uh, the government environmental uh, government environmental agencies and environmental scientists and environmental organizations. Yeah, you're just this poor little person working for a multi-million dollar think tank who pays you a very good salary. And that's all you do. You don't have to do research. You just publish stuff like this. And the numbers of these books, remember 92, Real Earth Summit? Look what happened. There were 27 books up through 1991, and then we hit 92, and it just explodes. These groups react. What does a counter movement do? It's like it's in a boxing match. You have the environmental movement and environmental agencies, environmental policy, and you have the counter movement. Well, when this group does something, this group has the counter. They go back and forth, right? It's a very common understanding. So we got another change here. 92, they're really focusing on environmental issues in general, but that Earth Summit, talking about climate change, biodiversity, and all these things. But climate change got a lot of attention. And you right, might remember the first Bush in for four years started out, I'm going to be an environmental president. But by the time of Rio, the true colors came out. And he, whoops, and uh, he was particularly concerned about climate change. And he said, the American way of life is not up for negotiations. We're not going to sign these treaties. We Americans have this apparently God-given inherent right, because there's no Buddha, uh, to, you know, to use the Earth's resources, et cetera, and drive big cars. I don't know. So anyway, they really started focusing more and more on climate change. And then when the Kyoto Protocol was proposed, that became a really critical issue. Now, why is this issue? Well, I've already hinted a bit here. Efforts to deal with climate change 
which is the ultimate regulation. You know, we must use energy. So the idea of dealing with climate change is viewed as the ultimate threat to free enterprise. Um, and the American way of life. It's gonna seen as bringing about unprecedented governmental regulations nationally and internationally. It's therefore become the environmental issue, the single most important environmental issue in our age of neoliberal, and I, everyone here, are you familiar in the English word neoliberal, which is really extreme conservative, you know, from the us, Austrian economist. It means over time it's been warped. Nowadays, they basically oppose all government regulations. We just want a free market. Let the market do its will. It's God's hand or something. So again, we get this kind of common claim. Global warming's a hoax. The real goal is communism. Okay, oh, I should warn you when the pictures, but I can't see. So, okay. so we see this a lot. And uh, so what did they do if you want to combat Climate change regulations. Manufacturing uncertainty became the crucial strategy. And what's interesting, early figures, these, the Marshall Institute was a, a think tank set up in the 90s. And how many of you remember Reagan's Star Wars initiative? We're gonna sh well, most scientists said, oh, Star Wars, that's ridiculous. They opposed it. These people set up the Marshall Institute to defend Reagan Star Wars, but they immediately also started focusing on climate change. And I'll show you one of their books shortly. And uh, the, the first Bush, what he, in fact, in Rio, he said, my scientists tell me global warming's not such a threat. He was referring to the people of the Marshall Institute. There's this other fellow here. What is interesting, both of these and some others were already involved in defending tobacco smoke. First, the, some of them, the original cigarette stuff, and then second uh, was the second hand smoke. So these people were quite involved, and that defending tobacco, for 20 years, they man managed to hold off regulations when the evidence was overwhelming. So it's common nowadays, and there are many articles as well as a book, they talk about the tobacco playbook. This is how you do things. If you want to fight evidence to stop government regulations, follow what the tobacco industry did. Here's the playbook. Now, I mentioned these folks, a relatively small number of them, uh, and they've always been around for environmental issues in general, but especially on climate change. They've really been active since the late 80s. And here's the problem. Remember, especially if you are with a think tank, you got the Stanford professor and someone with a think tank. So if you bring one of these people in, they're in, he has a PhD and such and such, and they're almost always he's. The public, the average American, even before Fox News made our country so much dumber, but the average American, you know, you've got two scientists, PhDs. How are they to dis, they don't know about Google Scholar and citations and X, uh, H indexes and all that stuff. They just treat them dueling experts. He said, she said. They don't look at their relevance, their publication records. Now, by now, almost all of these leading contrarians that have helped battle climate change have affiliations with one or more of the think tanks. And here are some of the leading ones. Only one of these guys, the strange man from MIT, had real credentials. Here is a, I don't know if he was born, he's Korean. I don't know if he's Korean American or born, but he's uh, joined them. The rest are old white men. So, these folks constantly attack climate science, but their efforts are supported and publicized by the movement. The think tanks, again, sponsor them, pay them at times. They are darlings of Fox News, talk radio, Wall Street Journal editorial page. They're invited to write things for the Wall Street Journal. They, they, it's just like there's a big, you know the word megaphone to amplify someone's voice? Well, the conservative media, that conservative echo chamber, it 
amplifies them. It gives them more visibility than the IPCC, for example, in America. It's ridiculous. So their expertise doesn't warrant it, but it gives, with all of the exposure they get in the media, it allows them to create the appearance of scientific controversy within the public realm, even though there's considerable consensus on human-caused climate change in the scientific realm, the typical American thinks it's a controversial issue. And we want to distinguish public versus this. So we started out with manufacturing uncertainty over specific products like DDT. Now we have manufacturing controversy over an entire field, climate science. Now, why is this so significant? And why was it such an achievement an unfortunate one by these people. Once you have the appearance of scientific controversy in the public realm, scientific norms for evaluating evidence, especially peer review, they no longer apply. The contrarian scientists and their supporters appeal to societal norms. And what does a societal norm say? Oh, well, we have to have freedom of speech. If you're going to have some person over here saying climate change is serious, you've got to allow the people who don't agree to speak. Oh, and we must hear both sides of the issue. Oh, you're saying that there are 98% over here and one or two over here? Well, but we only have room for two speakers. We need one from each side. And of course, we must respect minority viewpoints. So this amplifies, again, because they don't need to publish. They don't need to have referee journal articles. They're out there in the public realm. And they're, Repu oh, and the Republicans in Congress now love to invite these people to hearings. They will have three contrarians and one real climate scientist speak. So the, here's what happened. The denial machine went into overdrive after Al Gore's Inconvenient Truth put global warming back on the agenda. Its efforts escalated even more. So again, I already mentioned Obama comes into office, the Democratic uh, Congress for a short time, they're controlling Congress. It looked like we're gonna have regulations, so they really took off. They become very active again. And to analyze uh, the growth and diffusion of climate change, the one that prior colleague and I decided to do a new study, this time, not focusing on environmental skeptic books, but climate change denial books. We had counted many of these books in the prior study because denying climate change was denying this. The article, again, is published. So we're examining their links to think tanks, but also the, the location and academic backgrounds of the author and that. By location, I mean what country they're from. Several of these books in America are listed on Amazon. At one point, I went to Amazon and I typed in climatology, not climate, climate change, climatology. 14 of these books appeared with real scientific books on Amazon. And if you go in, when I go to a bookstore, like in an airport, I go to the environment or nature section and I look and almost always, there are several of these books there. They're very popular. So here's how they took off. 1982, there's one, but not much happens. 89, remember that? James Hansen's testimony. Then they just sort of go along until Al Gore gets active, and zoom, they take off. And they've stayed pretty active. We haven't kept track, but I'm thinking we've seen at least a dozen books a year since this. I want to point out something important, though. I don't know in your countries, but I assume in America, it's now very common to publish your own book. You know, if you're clever with Microsoft Word or something, you can just put out your book. In the old days, you needed a real press, a publisher. So something important, this is self-published books. There were very few, but now they've become more common. Keep that in mind. So. 
This is an interesting table, and by the way, it, invi it violates all rules for table construction that I teach in methods, so please don't ever make a table like this again, but I, I had to condense it. Here's what I want to show, 1980s, 90s, and past 2000. Five, so you can see the growth of books over time, right? Here's the key thing. Are they connected to a think tank? Of the five books early on, all were. In the 90s, 95% were. Now it drops to only 65, but why is this? It's these self-published books. There were only two, then there was one, but now a third of the books are self-published. And the thing is, and uh, excuse me, not a third of all books, but 39% uh, of all books Um, I'm a little jet lagged here, but here. Uh, the, the point is, of the books that are coming out of publishing houses, a majority, the important books, are still connected to a think tank. It's these informal books that someone, my favorite was a retired real estate agent. He started writing books for a hobby, and he's a good conservative, and he realized climate change is a hoax, so he wrote a book exposing that for his friends. And that's the kind of thing. They're not so important. Uh, they don't uh, get on bookstores and Amazon. Now, here's the, one of my themes here is that denial has diffused from America. It started out in the U.S., but it's been diffusing. We can see the most of the books, the majority, were published in the U.S., but the U.K., Canada, Australia, and here we go. A couple for Denmark, France, Sweden, one for that, uh, each of these countries. And, of course, there are books I know in places like Japan, China, also here that we didn't look at. Now, when I say diffused, in the 80s, 80% 80 of the books came from the US. When by the 90s, it's down to 63, and other countries are picking up. After 2000, we get more and more books from other countries. So over time, less than two thirds of the books. So we get this pattern, the American think tanks start something, and then it expands to other countries. And we see this right here. Uh, in the US, because of those self-published books, we're down to 65% of the books connected to a think tank. But in the UK, 79%, and other countries, 87 So it looks like, and we'll need data over time, when it diffuses to another country, it starts also heavily in the think tanks of those countries and then gradually will expand. So we get this diffusion. And finally, talked about looking at the, uh, the excuse me, the credentials of the authors. A lot of these are, again, people in fields like soil science. They're really not climate scientists at all, but they have a PhD. So in the 80s, most of the books were written by people with PhDs, and then it changes. Now we get other PhDs. These tend to be economists, some political scientists, policy people, so far no sociologists, thank God, and then the people over here without PhDs at all. And this is a lot of the self-published books. So again, th think of this as going from the contrarian scientist diffusing out. This, some book covers illustrate. Re remember this guy? This is the Marshall Institute, published in 1989. Look at that title, Scientific Perspectives. These guys were all physicists, well known. So this was the typical book. By 90s, this guy has been working in denial forever. Now you see the theme, the satanic gases clearing the air about global warming. Then we get an attorney working for the Competitive Enterprise Institute, red hot lies, how global warming alarmists, blah, 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 blah. 
So you see the tone from scientific denial to blaming people, as attacking their character. And finally, here's one of the self-published books. It's not so important. So you can kind of see from the covers these themes. Now, where does this leave us? No, well, not a lot of time, so let me go. Um, mainstream climate science tells us, through the IPC's reports, that global warming is occurring and will continue. Human activities producing greenhouse gas emissions are a significant cause. Human warming produces, global warming produces harmful impacts on humans and natural systems. And therefore, scientists aren't supposed to say this, but many argue these findings suggest the need for policies to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. If it's doing all this thing, shouldn't we do something? The denial themes are like this. Basically, they try to undermine mainstream climate science, so they take issue with all these. And uh, Stefan Ramsdorf in Germany, famous climate scientist, labels uh, three types of denials, trend denial. For a long time, they simply denied the Earth is getting warmer. They said it's not. And most recently, they made a big to-do about the idea that, oh, there's a big pause. It stopped warming. Then there's attribution denial. Well, it might be getting warmer, but humans are not the cause. We might be having more hurricanes, but humans are not the cause. Then there's impact denial. Ah, if it gets warmer, so that will be inconsequential. I don't like to shovel snow. I like warm weather. I live in Minnesota. I want to have wine, a wine vineyard and uh, so forth. Crazy stuff, totally unecological. And finally, though, Policy denial. There's no need for carbon reduction policies. Uh, such policies will do far more harm than global warming. Over time, the counterclaims issued by these skeptics, and especially the scientists, have evolved, again, as a counter movement in response to growing evidence. They, go, they stop going from it's not occurring to it won't be harmful to it's naturally caused. Nowadays, you get things like there's... There's nothing we can do to stop it. Or why should we try to do anything? Look at those Chinese and those Indians. They're doing all that stuff. Why should we Americans do anything? Uh, they just have one idea after another. These counterclaims never disappear. It's like a big file drawer. They put them, they file them, and then they pull them out and maybe modify them later on. But the bottom line, so the counterclaims change over time, the bottom line never changes, no regulation. This reflects the near universal neoliberal anti-regulatory ideology. That's the driving force. So individuals uh, pr promoting denial, especially these book authors, criticize climate science. They rarely contribute to the scientific literature. They avoid peer review with their blog posts, op-eds, think tank reports, et cetera. Of the books we examined, most were published by conservative or popular presses, not a single one by a university press. More generally, virtually none of this literature undergoes anything approximating peer review. Right? That's a very different story. Okay, um, oh goodness. Well, let me wrap, we, you know, we started seven or eight minutes late here, so I, I, they told me to talk for an hour, and now I'm, uh, okay. Real quickly, the absence of peer review allows book authors and authors of denial material to claim whatever they want. It's like zombie arguments. You know, zombies are walking dead people, the scientists look at this, they evaluate the claim and say, that's false. We've studied this, it's not true. They think they buried it, but it comes back. So they pull these out, and we're seeing them constantly used in the Trump administration. So we have this uh, situation here. The overwhelming literature from science is clearly that climate change exists. But in the public realm, by continually manufacturing uncertainty, they've created the impression that climate change is a subject of controversy, and it's become a very politically polarized issue. Republicans especially simply don't believe in climate change in America. So, I, to sum up, evidence that their efforts to deny the seriousness of climate change have been successful. 
The US media still give more attention to denial and portray climate science as uncertain than is the case in other countries. The American public consistently expresses less concern about climate change than publics of other developed nations, but it's mainly due to Republicans and conservatives going down. The US has yet to enact any climate change policy. It's been an impediment to international make it policy making, we've seen this. Climate change denial has become a core element of conservatives and Republicans' worldview. To be a good conservative, you must be in favor of God, opposed to gays, love guns, opposed to abortion, and be anti-immigration. Global warming is part of that. And it's especially apparent now where the Republican Party is almost unified in opposition. And sadly, the Republicans in Congress are allowing Trump to do all these things. I had added some things on Asia because I know that climate change denial is not nearly as strong here, but there's something called the Atlas Network of think tanks. They have 480 think tanks in 90 countries, including several in Japan, many in China, some Korea, and I assume Taiwan, I couldn't find it. You need to watch these. When you see a climate change denial person talking, try to find out where his or maybe her home roots are, who they're connected to, and you will probably find a think tank. Okay, I can stop there. This is the story. I hope it helps give you some insight of how we have arrived at such a crazy place with the US being the villain in international climate change. Thank you.